This tutorial is for you if you know some basic SQL and you have a family tree online or in a desktop application. I'll show you how to create frequency reports from the place names in your family tree. We'll start with exploring your tree data. Then we'll do some cleaning and standardizing the place names. We'll prepare frequency data and then we'll use some free tools to generate fantastic geographic charts. There are some steps to complete before you create your report. First step is to export your family tree to a JetCom file. You will then install the free RootsMagic application and use it to convert your JetCom file into a database. You then install a SQL browser and write SQL scripts that you run against your tree database. To get you set up, we have a PDF guide that you can download with all the steps and links to the installs. You can watch our two minute quick launch video, which runs through the installations, or you can walk through our 30 minute video tutorial, which goes every step of the way. This one is the most appropriate if you're a beginner to SQL. I'm using SQLite Expert as my browser. You may be using dBeaver. I'm going to connect to my RootsMagic dot rm tree file which is my database click open database I'm going to find that dot rm tree file remember that default extension set by sql light expert is any of these extensions here i'm looking for a dot rm tree file so it doesn't show up with this set as it is so change that to all files and here i can see a dot rm tree file i'm going to open this one and here on the left are the tables in this database. For place name frequency report, the table I want to start with is with place table. I'm going to give myself a new SQL tab so I can run SQL scripts and I'm going to take a look at all the contents of that table. Select star from place table and then you hit the execute SQL button. Now this gives me a full list of the contents now, if you're thinking, oh, I must have a very wide and dispersed family because these are a whole lot of different places. These lower number places where we're starting at one, they're not my tree. Roots Magic in the software has some extra functionality where it needs lots of places. What we need to do is scroll down and here we go. These are places from my family tree. So I recognize these places from my family tree. When I scroll over to the right and look at the other columns in this table, there's not a whole lot. I can see latitude and longitude columns that aren't filled in. I can see this reverse field just reverses the order of the place parts. But there's nothing in this table that indicates whether any given address is related to a birth event, a death event, a marriage event in my tree. I need to know how the place table fits together with some other tables in the database. In other words, how these place names are associated with events. So the next table I'm going to take a look at is the event table. I'll take a look at all the contents, select star from event table, execute that. The event table represents events that happen in your tree where you've recorded a birth event, marriage event, death event, immigration, emigration, a row gets created in this table. These fields here are a lot of lookups to other tables. And the one that jumps out at us is this place ID column. That ID is a lookup to place table. An event has a date, like birth date, death date, and that date is here. This is year 1949, month 06, June 17. And then if I scroll over to the right, there are other fields that we don't need to take much notice of. For this particular report, the fields that we're most interested in is this field here, the place ID. And then we also need to know if this is an event that has a particular place, what type of event is it? And that's the event type. And the event type is a lookup to a table called the fact type table. This table here, we'll take a look at the full contents of the fact type table. And here we can see that this is a reference table with all the types of events that you could record in your tree. Act type one is birth, death, christening, burial, and so on and so forth. An event has a type, birth, marriage, death, etc. And it happens at a place. If we diagram that out, this is the entity relationship diagram. Don't worry if you're not used to these. 
You see in the middle there, you have your event table, which has the event type, place ID, and a date. If we look to the right, the event type is a lookup to that fact type table. And in order to know the type of event, we need to go and check the event type, which is a number, one, two, three, four. One happens to be birth. So we'll see birth in that name. And then over on the left, there's a link from the event table to a specific place ID. The place ID being this numeric that in our tree, around about number 201, 202, starts the place names that we have recorded against a particular event. So back to my SQL queries, I now want to write a SQL query that gets every occurrence of a birth recorded in my tree. So that query is going to be select star from the event table, which records all events. I want to restrict those events to those that are only birth events. I'm going to give the event table an alias ET, so I don't have to keep on typing event table. I'm going to use an inner join to the fact type table. I'm going to give it an alias of FTT, and I am going to join those two tables on FTT. And the browser gives me a helpful pop-up list of all the fields in fact type table. I'll choose the fact type ID equals to ET, the alias of the event table. So I get this pop-up list and I'll choose the event type table. If you're using a different browser, you may just have to type these out. And having joined those two tables, I can now add a where clause, a filter on fact type where FTT.name is equal to birth. In many database systems, this would be perfect SQL. In fact, it is good standard SQL, but we're going to hit our first glitch with the roots magic data Database. So I'm going to run this query, execute SQL, and I get a pop-up message saying no such collation sequence, RM, no case. RM for Roots Magic, no case. Problem here is that this Roots Magic database has some proprietary built-in code to support the Roots Magic software. We're not using the software for using the database, and we don't actually have access to that proprietary code. So we're going to force our SQL query to get around that. And to do so, use the keyword collate and no case. You're going to get a little weary of typing collate no case a lot in your SQL statements. There is a workaround that lets you never have to do that again. I go into it in our course, which if you check the link below, you can find more details. So back to our problem SQL query, I'm now going to add the keywords collate no case, and I will run this. And now I get a data set of all events of type birth. What I'm looking for is the place name for each of these rows. There is a column place ID in the event table is a lookup to the place table. So I am now going to copy down this query. I'm going to add an inner join to the place table, giving it an alias of PT on PT place ID equal to the place ID in the event table. And all I want in terms of fields is the name from that place table. Run this query. And now you see I have for every row where I have a birth event with an associated place, I have that place here. Due to my heritage, many are Ireland, but if I scroll down, because I see Australia there, New South Wales, Australia, I see Canada expanded a little. I see Westfield Union, New Jersey. I see Brooklyn, Kings County, New York. And I wouldn't normally do a frequency report on the full place name. Usually I want to see frequencies by country or by state. But I'll start off with the simplest frequency report, which is on the entire place name. So to do my first frequency report, I am going to copy this down. I want to group by the place name, give me count of how many rows in the table are for a particular place name. To do that, I use the keyword beneath the where clause, group by, and the field of which I'm grouping, which is the name in the place table. And then I want to do a count. So my query looks like that. Again, that is a good SQL. Hit execute. And once again, I have my collation error. And when you get it, you just need to have a quick look and see, well, where have I added string field with logic against it? I need to add collate no case. See how that goes. And now you can see I'm getting my counts. One of the useful things about the counts at the full place name level is that you will probably start seeing issues with some of your place names. Let's scroll down to the Bs and show you 
a problem with my data. Just expand this. And if I focus in on Brooklyn, you can see that I don't have consistency in how I've recorded Brooklyn, Kings County, New York, USA. I have a cluster, seven people with birth records recorded in this format, but I also have someone recorded as Brooklyn, just Kings, no county. I have two people, Brooklyn, New York City, New York, and I have three people here with Kings County, Brooklyn brackets, New York, and instead of USA, I have United States of America. All of those should be grouped together in one row, representing Brooklyn. And because they're not, because the formatting of the address is inconsistent, that's going to skew my charts. It's going to make it look as if I have less numbers in Brooklyn than I actually have. Now you may have perfect data, but most of us don't. And one really useful SQL project is to work through and identify all these inconsistencies and fix them in your tree. Re-export your JEDCOM, pull them in, Truth Magic, new database, and now run even better quality reports and you have a better tree. I'm not going to do that now. That's a separate lesson in our course. I may do a YouTube video on it too, on identifying inconsistencies in your address data. But subscribe to the channel to see what next videos I have up on this kind of thing. Sign up for the course if you want to deep dive in fixing inconsistencies using SQL. But for now, I'll continue with this particular project, which is charting my address data off its current state of quality. We need to consider how we're going to split our place names up so we can run reports on different levels. Here are four rows with place names within the United States. The first row here has four parts. We have the country at the end, we have a state, we have a county, and we have a town going from right to left. This next row has three parts. Again, the country is at the end, the state, second last, and the county. Third row, two parts, country and state. And finally here we have a one part row, which only has the country. So the USA is represented in all these four rows. The country is at the end of the string. More tricky is that the state is in three of the rows. In this first row, it's in the third position. In the second row, it's in the second position. And in this row, it's in the first position. What we want to do in order to run reports of our place names is we need to break these up into consistent parts. So we want to parse the place name into four distinct parts, but not each row has every part. Each of the rows has the country, part four. Three of the rows have a state, two have a county, and only one of them has this town. Now, if you're not from the United States, let's say for me in Ireland, typical address for me would be something that looks like this. Town, county, country. And just because most of my Irish addresses are three parts instead of four, I don't want to put Tralee in part one, Kerry in part two, and put Ireland in part three, because that means that when I'm doing reports, my countries aren't lining up. I still want this to be Ireland in part four, the county here, and then the town. So even though if most of your addresses, depending on where you're from, are even just two parts, I would suggest that you follow the format in this tutorial and go with the four part breakdown. It may turn out that when you actually do parse out your addresses that mostly part three and part four are populated and you'll have blanks in part one and part two, but that's okay. The reports work consistently. So in our next step, we are going to use SQL to break each row into consistently formatted parts back to our data and it's probably clear to see that we can use the comma to break up our place names. I've mentioned that I think my place names break up into a max of four parts, which would be three commas, but how can I be sure? Well, let's double check and you can double check your own data. I'll copy this query down and I am going to change in order to count the number of commas. I'm going to use a nice little trick. I'm going to get the length of a particular name field. In other words, how many characters are in that name field. Then I'm going to get the length of the name field if I strip out the commas. So I'm going to use the replace function on the name field. With the replace function, I give it the character that I want to replace, and then I would give it what I want to replace with. So find the comma and replace it with empty string. And I'll call that comma count. And then I'm going to group by the comma count down here. And I want to take out this filter. I'm not interested anymore in filtering on the USA. 
but I am interested in filtering on birthplaces. So let's see what that looks like. So I have 85 rows that don't have a comma at all, and they will be rows like USA. 134 rows, that is one comma. 179, that's two commas. And my max number of commas, three. Your mileage may vary. If you have a lot of rows where you actually have four, commas you may go down to the street name then you will just need to adjust the sequel that i'm going to show you accordingly now i mentioned 85 rows with no commas and i said that they were probably going to be usa ireland etc well let's take a look i don't want a group by i want where this is a birth record and the number of commas is equal to zero and i just want to look at the actual data and you can see my assumption that these are countries is mostly right, but not always. I have a couple of records up here that do not seem to follow the pattern. And here we have them. So if I expand that, what I have is what's clearly a three part place name with a space instead of a comma. What I should do is go back now, find the people for those two birth rows and go and amend my tree. But not in this tutorial. I'll do that in another tutorial. For now, I'm just going to ignore them. Or what it does go to show, coin a phrase. Make life simple. I'm going to build up my SQL for parsing using a set of sample data. Then I'll take that SQL and I'll run it against my real data. So I'm going to give myself a sample table. It has only one column called name. And I'm going to insert four rows. First row is text country second row has one comma state comma country third row two commas county state country fourth row has three commas town county state country run that now i'm going to look at that data with a simple query that retrieves both the name field and then the number of commas and you see i have zero one two and three commas so this represents the data in my full place table. I'm now going to write the SQL that will parse this up into a maximum of four parts, where country, regardless of which row and how many commas, will always be in part four. I'm not going to try and do the parsing all in one go. I'm going to build this up. Just give myself a little heading here using comments. This is for part four. Copy this down. And now I'm going to write a SQL statement that says when there are no commas in the name field, the full string can be put in part four. So this is a conditional statement. So I'm going to use the syntax case. I'm going to give myself a comment to say what I'm doing. And now I'm going to use the keyword when this count of commas is equal to zero, then take the name field. And I'm going to alias that as part four. I'm just going to run this. And you can see what's going on here, that where I have zero commas, country is put into part four. But when I have one, two or three commas, nothing happens. So I just get this null here. Now, I want to deal with a situation where I have one comma. And if I have one comma, then I want to find that comma. And then I want to put the string that comes after that comma into part four. I'm now going to have a new when clause. And this time it's when the number of commas is equal to one. Just get myself a comment. What am I going to do? I am going to use the substring function, which grab parts of strings. So substring on the name field, I want to find the comma. So I'm going to use the in string function. So that is find within this string, work on the name field and target the comma. So I want to take the substring of the position of the comma, which is, let's say it's one, two, three, four, five, it's here. I want to take then from here to the end of the string. And that is still going in as part four. So I'll run this and you'll see one little wrinkle, but we'll fix it. But I'll run this first. Okay. You see where I have one comma. I now am finding that comma and putting everything that comes after the comma into part four. But notice how this is offset. That's because I've got this space. In my data, I've got comma space USA or Canada or Ireland. In order to deal with that little space, I'm going to use the trim function. I'm going to wrap what I've got with the trim function. That'll take out that space. I'll run this. And now you see that this data is aligned. So that's where I had one comma. Next F, as you guessed it, I want to deal with two commas. Give myself a comment 
if I have two commas, like here, I want to find the second comma and then take the rest of the string after the second comma. So when I use the int string, I need it to work twice. The first time I run an int string function on this row, it's going to find the first comma. I need it to find the second comma. And that looks like this. Now you're probably thinking this is getting a little bit complex. This combination of substring and string, and then this in string, substring and string, take my word for it, but this is what skips that first comma and gives me everything after the second comma. Then I'm wrapping a trim around it just to get rid of that space. Let's see what that looks like. Yep, that's got it right. And finally, I want to deal with three commas. And if you think that the query is kind of kind of look like this, but it's going to have an extra clause here, then you'd be right. I'll give myself my comment and my entire clause. This is finding the first comma, the second comma, the third comma, and then picking up the string after that third comma. Okay, here it is in all its glory for part four. This is it. This is all I need for part four. So here's the SQL for part three, which for American addresses is going to be the state like Arkansas or Colorado, and it will come before the country. So you can see where we have one comma. This SQL is finding the comma and taking the string before that comma. But notice that when there's no commas, we see here an empty string. And that is this statement, which we didn't see in part four. So when there's no commas, then we simply put this empty string into part three. We'll just run part two. Part two, which is looking usually for American data, that will be the county. It won't be there when there are zero or one commas. And that's what's going on here. Other than that, we go parse and find that county based on where it is in relation to the number of commas. And finally, part one, let's try on this. Part one is only applicable when we have three commas. So here, when the number of commas is zero, one, or two, then put in the empty string. Otherwise, we're finding that first comma and we're taking the string before it. So now you've seen the SQL run against the sample data. What you really want is this SQL run against the place data from the database. So I'm going to take all of the SQL and I'm going to make a rather large SQL statement looking to parse place name data from my birth records. So this is the full query. I will scroll down because I can't fit it all in one screen. Here's part one. Here's part two. Here's part three and part four. Still pulling from this name field. The difference in terms of this SQL is I've got an alias in front of the name field. I didn't have that in my sample table because I wasn't joining to anything. This is pulling the name from the place table. And this query here should look very familiar to you because that is simply what we've worked on before. There is a link in the description below where you can go and get this script. But we're not done yet. If I run this, here are the results. Most of my Irish addresses are only going to have three parts. So you're going to have to scroll down a bit. And here I can see some American records where I have four parts. So now I've got the query. My next step is that I'm going to store this data, all 476 records with part one, part two, part three, part four, into a table in this database. That's a handy shortcut so that I don't have to keep running this rather large query. I'm going to create a table called place part, create table, place part. And I'm going to use the SQL statement to create the table for me. Let's so run this. Now I'm going to take a look at the data in place part, and it is the same data. So if you're following along, you now have a table in your Roots Magic database. If you were to do some corrections in your tree, you know, fix up some place names, export your JEDCOM, pull it into a new Roots Magic database, you'll have to run this query again to create the table because in the new Roots Magic database, this table will no longer exist. So now we've got the data, let's do a chart. I'm going to do it both in Google Sheets and in Microsoft Excel. It's my data, Control C to copy that into the clipboard. Now I'm going to switch over to Google Sheets. I've got this new spreadsheet, no data in it. Put my cursor into A1. I'm going to Control V to paste that data. And now I want to turn this into a chart. So I go to Insert, Chart. A pie chart here is good for this data. It gives me a good representation of the dominant country in my family tree in proportion to the other less represented countries. So now I'm going to do the same chart in Microsoft Excel, a blank sheet. 
I've still got that data in my clipboard. So click on A1 and hit Control V to copy it in. To get my chart, I'm going to go to Insert, Recommended Charts. Once again, I'm going to choose the pie chart. Click OK. Spread that out a bit to make the proportions a little better. I would like to see the percentages. I've gone up to here to Quick Layout and it gives me a few options. This is the one, Layout 1, which puts the percentages onto the chart itself. It's rather difficult to see with that black on blue. Now that's easier. Okay, so this black background gives me a white font with the numbers. That's what I want. So the next chart we're going to create in both Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel is a world heat map. This is a representation of the world as a map where the colors are to show the proportion or the frequency of entries in your family tree for that particular area. So in this particular set of colors, red is sparsely populated and it moves towards varying shades of green to get the more populated areas. So I'll start with Google Sheets. And then I'll do Microsoft Excel. I'm going to grab my data set again. I'm going to go to an empty sheet in Google Sheets. And this particular heat map, the world heat map, is built in to Google Sheets. You don't have to, to go and get any extensions. I'm going to paste my data. Oh, that's still highlighted. I go to Insert, Chart. And this time, the default is the pie chart. We've already done that. Now we're going to look for a different type of chart. So if you expand the drop down, and then you have to scroll down to see the maps available to you. So I'm going to take this geo chart, and this is what it looks like with my current set of data. If I just get rid of that and make this a bit bigger, you can see that showing red, as you hover over it, you'll see why it says red. I've, I've got three birth entries in Australia. I've got a few in Scotland. Ireland is very green. And then I've got a few in Canada. And notice this pink. Red is not a lot. Pink is on the way towards green. So let's say you have Microsoft Excel, and you prefer to do it there. Open up a bank sheet in Microsoft Excel, paste in my data. Again, I'm going to look for a particular type of chart. Go to insert. Now you can get to the maps chart via recommended charts, or you can simply go straight here to maps. Take this field map. I'll expand this a bit. And once again, you can see that this is a heat map. It's actually not as good a representation, I think, as the one in Google Sheets and that it just everything seems to be a lot smaller. For me, this isn't really working with that well. See Ireland, this tiny little spot <laughs> down here. And the, the colors are going from light blue to dark blue. I think I prefer the more contrasting colors of the default color options in Google Sheets. However, you can play around with the color base. Let me see what the options here are. OK, that might be a little bit better. So I'm looking at the styles up here. As you scroll over, it's showing you the styles. If I pick that one and then change red, you can play around with this a bit. Ah, that might be a little clearer. Play around with it and see what works for you. The next chart I'm going to show you is a bar chart of the US states represented as birthplaces in your family tree. You can look something like this. I'll show you how to make it. So we need a new, so we need a new group by query. The one that we've been using is being at part four. To get US states, we want to go to part three. So I want to restrict to only US states. So this will be my query. I'm taking part three, a state, doing a count. I'm taking this where part three is actually filled in. It's not blank. And part four, which is at the country level, is equal to USA. But I'm grouping on part three and ordering by the count descending. So I'll run that. And this is my output. I only have nine states. You may have many more and much higher numbers. I'll copy that and I'm going to drop it into a new Google Sheet. Paste it here. I go to insert a chart. Again, the default pie chart is not what I want. I want to expand the chart types and I want to look for a bar chart. Now, you may want a horizontal bar chart. You may want a vertical bar chart. For this type of data, I prefer a horizontal bar chart. And this is what it looks like. Just get rid of that. Change the title to US 
date birth places and then you can play around with the details with the background colors similarly in excel i'm in a new sheet in excel i will paste my data go to insert this time i can go to recommended charts you can have a vertical bar chart or a horizontal bar chart i like the horizontal the only wrinkle here is that you don't get the choice of whether you have a horizontal with the larger numbers from the top or from the bottom. I prefer the larger numbers to be represented at the top, but you've got to modify this once you've actually chosen the single cluster bar. Click OK, make this a little bigger. Change the order. I go to the Y axis, double click it. Up comes this format axis. So I just double click that area. And down here, you see this tick box to show categories in reverse order. So these are considered to be the categories along the Y axis. I click this and you can see that it shows them in reverse order. Play around with the colors and layout then as you see fit. Now for my last and possibly favorite chart, because it does look cool, the heat map of US states. The downside is that you can't do it in Microsoft Excel. You can only do it in Google Sheets. The upside is Google Sheets is free. You do have to install an extension. You do have to install an extension and the free part of the extension gives you this display. Let's go to the process of setting this up. In Google Sheets, I've got a new spreadsheet. Copy my data and I want that US state chart, but it doesn't come with the standard charts. So I'm going to install an extension called Map Chart for Google Sheets. To do so, Go to Extensions, Add-ons, Get Add-ons. This takes you to the Google Workspace Marketplace and we'll just type in Map Chart and then you'll see for Google Sheets. Choose this and I am going to install it. I'm going to say yes to the privileges at once. And here it's showing you the kind of charts you can make. The one that's highlighted here is the one that comes for free. So I'll just click close on this. So now we need to use our new extension. So here, extensions, go to map chart for Google Sheets and click on create map. And then it may seem like nothing's happening, but you just gotta give it a, a moment. It pops this window in the right hand side. And here, well, it's not showing me a whole lot of colors. First of all, it's asking me where to get the data. And notice that it's looking at sheet two. Well, I'm not on sheet two. Sheet two has my prior examples, which has actually has a country in it. I'm on sheet four. Toggle this down and select the sheet that you have put your states on. It gives it a little bit of time. I do have a header row. And then that, there you go. I didn't have to do anything. It took a little bit of time, but it went and found that you're on sheet four. It looked at your headers and it recognizes this state as corresponding to what it expects, which is a list of states. And it recognizes that the colors or its color scheme should be based on the counts. Now, if you have called your data set something different, suppose you call this US underscore state and you call this total, you just got to go and choose your correct headings. And notice that suddenly these colors did pop in and that's giving me a preview. Not a huge amount of extra customization I can do without paying. You can play around with that yourself to see what options that you have for free. I want to grab this. Go to Actions. You can either insert it into the sheet with this Insert button. Give it a bit of time. And here it is as a big image in the sheet. Or you can download it as ping file, an image file. You notice that I don't have a huge amount of colors. In my tree, I just don't have a huge amount of US state. When I showed you the sample, I manually added extra rows in the spreadsheet. Just get rid of this. Give myself a few rows here. Now I have to remember the names of states. I'll give that a 20. And now with this larger data set, what does that look like? Back up to extensions, map chart for Google Sheets. Create map, give it a bit of time. This time it's remembered, I've got sheet four. And you can see I've got a few more colors in this sheet. I've got actions, insert, a bit more colorful. That's the final chart I wanted to show you. 
If you want more tutorials on great things to do with SQL and your family tree, check out our playlist on the Data Mining DNA YouTube channel. We already have a tutorial on running frequency charts on the names in your family tree. We have more to come, so subscribe to our channel to get notifications of our next tutorials. If you want the scripts we use, we've also got links in the description below. This YouTube video is a shortened and simpler version of one lesson of our online course on how to use SQL to analyze your family trees. The course is based around at least 10 SQL projects where we build up queries to run useful SQL reports on your family tree database. Here's a course breakdown. Lesson one creates a detailed person list with each person's birth date and birthplace, death date and death place, plus their parents' details. Lesson two involves creating a surname frequency report which can give you insights into the most prominent family lines in your tree. Lesson three shows you how to parse the addresses for the birthplaces and death places into manageable pieces for further analysis. That would be pieces such as the town, state and countries into separate fields. Once you've separated out the addresses, lesson four builds on this to create frequency reports for state, towns and counties. This will let you identify key locations in your family's history. Still working with locations, lesson five gives you the at this place report where you learn how to create a list of all the family tree events, births, marriages, deaths, etc. Whatever you've added as facts to your family tree at a given location. Then we move on to provide a similar report of family tree events at a specific date. Lesson seven involves doing some data cleansing on your family tree. So we show you techniques and queries to find duplicate individuals in your tree. Lesson eight, we look at some classic age issues that would include individuals whose birth and death date mean that they must have lived 170 years. So something's gone wrong in your records. And Lesson nine is a gap report where we will identify missing details in your tree. That would include married women without a maiden name or all the people without a death location. Number 10, we put this towards the end of the course because it's probably something you want, which is to show the ancestral lines, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, etc. That's a tricky SQL challenge, which we will show you how to do. Once you've got your ancestral lines, we then look at the ancestor gap report. What we're looking for here is branches and lines where you're missing great, 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 greats. So if you're really interested in this course, it's not quite ready to launch yet. We'll put a link in the description below to where you can pre-register for the course for free. We just need your email and we will send you notification of when the course lessons become available for purchase.